Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia, and I'm beginning today a new series. I'm going to be reading through Augustine of Hippo's classic work, The Harmony of the Evangelist, its original Latin title, De Consensu Evangelistarum. Um, I wanted to do this opening episode to serve as an introduction to the longer project. So I'm going to be, much as I did, if you're familiar with the series I did on Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, I'm going to be doing a consecutive reading of uh, this work, The Harmony of the Evangelists by Augustine, along with adding some notes and commentary upon the work. Um, this work by um, Augustine, uh, again, usually given the English title, Harmony of the Evangelists, is also known under the title, The Harmony of the Gospels. Uh, for the reading of the work, I'm going to be using an old translation of it. It's in a series that was edited by Marcus Dodds, titled The Works of Aurelius Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, a new translation, volume eight, which has the Sermon on the Mount and the Harmony of the Evangelists. This was published in Edinburgh by T&T Clark in 1873, and the translation uh, in this edition is by S.F.D. Salmond. I'm going to be posting uh, the notes I'm reading to you on my blog at jeffriddle.net. And I'll also put a link to uh, an online Latin edition of this same work, Augustine's Harmony of the Evangelist. So let's begin with a very brief sketch of the life of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430, was the influential bishop of Hippo in North Africa. He was born to a Christian mother uh, named Monica and a pagan father. He was intellectually gifted, embraced Neoplatonic philosophy, and became a teacher of rhetoric in Milan, Italy. In Italy, uh, he was introduced to and dabbled in an Eastern religion known as Manichaeism which he eventually rejected, and he came under the sway of the preaching of Ambrose, uh, the famed bishop of Milan. In 386, Augustine was converted. He'll later write about this in his work, The Confessions. He describes walking in a garden and hearing a voice uh, saying, tole lege, take up and read. And he picked up a Bible and he read, famously read, a passage from Romans, Romans 13, 13. And this was used for his conversion. After his baptism, he returned to North Africa, thinking he might establish a monastic community uh, with a circle of his Christian friends. But he was soon pressed into ministerial service by his local bishop. And eventually he would serve as a bishop himself of the city of Hippo. Augustine was a prolific writer, teacher, and theologian. He was also a polemicist and apologist who was engaged in the great controversies of his day, including the so-called Donatist controversy that dealt with the restoration of those who, accept, who had accepted compromise during earlier seasons of persecution, and the Pelagian controversy dealing with the unorthodox teachings of Pelagius, who denied the power and extent of sin among fallen men. Among Augustine's two best-known works are his Confessions, which I previously mentioned. Many consider the Confessions to be the earliest example of an autobiography, although if you've read it, there's a lot of theology also in the Confessions. And he's also known for his work, The City of God, which was his defense of Christianity in the face of those pagans who blamed Christianity for the fall of Rome that took place in AD 410. Augustine himself, when he died, was within the city of Hippo while it was being uh, besieged uh, by invaders. Augustine's writings had an immense influence in the generations after his death particularly in the Western world. In the Middle Ages, he was acknowledged to be one of the four preeminent so-called doctors of the Western Church, the others being Gregory the Great, Ambrose, and Jerome. 
Augustine's teachings on original sin, predestination, and the sovereignty of God in salvation were among the hallmarks of what would come to be called Augustinian theology, a perspective that was heartily retrieved, in particular at the time of the Protestant Reformation. So having uh, given a brief sketch of the life of Augustine, let's turn and let me give a brief introduction to this particular work, his Harmony of the Evangelists. The introduction I'm going to share is going to be based uh, widely on the introductory notes uh, that are provided by the translator of this work, uh, Salmond. Uh, if you look in that 1873 edition from which I'm going to be reading, there's, he has a section titled Introductory Notice, and it's found on pages 135 to 138. And I'm going to share liberally some quotations from Salman's uh, introduction. The composition of this work, The Harmony of the Evangelists, is assigned to about the year A.D. 400. So Augustine wrote it in about the year 400. According to Salman, quote, Among Augustine's numerous theological productions, this one takes rank with the most toilsome and exhaustive, end quote, pages 135 to 136. It is an apologetic and polemical work. The editor notes, quote, Its great object is to vindicate the gospel against the critical assaults of the heathen, end quote, page 136. Persecution having failed, pagans tried to discredit the faith, quote, by slandering its doctrine, impeaching its history, and attacking with special persistency the veracity of the gospel writers, end quote, page 136. He continues, quote, Many alleged that the original Gospels had received considerable additions of a spurious character, and it was a favorite manner of argumentation adopted by both pagan and Manichaean adversaries to urge that the evangelical historians contradicted each other, end quote, page 136. The plan of the work is presented in four divisions, so there are four books that make up the harmony of the evangelists. In book one, quote, he refutes those who asserted that Christ was only the wisest among men and who aimed at detracting from the authority of the Gospels by insisting on the absence of any written compositions proceeding from the hand of Christ himself and by affirming that the disciples went beyond what had been his own teaching both on the subject of his divinity and on the duty of abandoning the worship of the gods, end quote, page 136. In book two, quote, he enters upon a careful examination of Matthew's gospel on to the record of the supper, comparing it with Mark, Luke, and John, and exhibiting the perfect harmony subsisting between them, end quote, pages 136 and 137. In book three, Augustine, quote, demonstrates the same consistency between the four evangelists from the, the account of the supper to the end, end quote, page 137. Finally, in book four, quote, he subjects to a similar investigation those passages in Mark, Luke, and John, which have no proper parallels in Matthew, end quote, page 137. Salman notes that in taking up this task, Augustine was both, quote, gifted with much, but he also lacked much, end quote. He had a high view of scripture, but, quote, he was deficient in exact scholarship, end quote, page 137. Though well-versed in Latin literature, quote, he knew little Greek and no Hebrew, end quote, page 137. The editor notes that there is, quote, less digression, end quote, than is customary in his writing, and he less frequently indulges in, quote, extravagant allegorizing, end quote, page 137. He has, quote, an inordinate dependence, end quote, on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and almost uh, uh, seems to claim, quote, special inspiration, end quote, for it. See pages 137 to 138. With respect to Augustine's harmonization of the gospel narratives, Salmond observes, quote, In general, he surmounts the difficulty of what may seem at first sight discordant versions of one incident 
by supposing different instances of the same circumstances or repeated utterance of the same words, end quote, page 138. Furthermore, quote, he holds emphatically by the position that wherever it is possible to believe two similar incidents to have taken place, no contradiction can legitimately be alleged, although no evangelist may relate them both together, end quote, page 238. Finally, Salmon suggests Augustine's work should not be subjected to overly harsh judgment, given he entered into a so-called untrodden field, see page 138. His work cannot be denied, quote, the merit of grandeur in original conception and exemplary faithfulness in actual execution, end quote, page 138. It is this harmony of the evangelist that we will attempt to read and to offer notes and commentary upon in upcoming episodes of this series. I hope that you'll find this series to be helpful and encouraging, and I'll look forward to meeting you again when we begin the series with uh, a further episode. Till then, take care and God bless.